surely we all have stories about being lost. I have just about zero sense of direction and get lost really easily. I can't tell you the number of times I found myself going the wrong direction on the freeway or missing a turn or ending up who knows where. I can still remember many years ago the look on my daughter's face. She was two and we were standing in line at McDonald's with some friends. Kathleen reached out and held onto the leg of my friend, thinking it was me. She looked up and there was an expression of sheer panic on her face when she saw that the leg she was holding onto was Shirley's, not mine. Where was mom? We have all known that fear, that pit in the bottom of our stomach when we are lost. We all know that sense of frustration when we misplace something. Just where are those keys? And my cell phone? Today is a day we observe losses on a national level. September 11th, the loss of life, the loss of our sense of security. And with people around the world, we mourn the death of Queen Elizabeth. I would imagine that folk in Jesus' time knew about loss as well. Our two stories in today's gospel, the sheep and the coin, talk about being lost and being found. What they tell is that God is deeply, incredibly in love with us, each one of us. The shepherd leaves the 99 sheep to go and look for the one which is lost. The woman stops all she's doing to look for the one coin. Both the shepherd and the woman search and search until they find the one that has been lost. When we lose something, we generally look for a while. Sometimes we give up and replace it with something new. But God is not like that. God does not give up. God does not stop, it, stop searching for what is lost. And that says to us that God does not throw us away. God does not replace us with something new. We are not disposable throwaways in God's eyes. The prophet Isaiah puts it this way. You are precious in my sight and honored and I love you. You are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. These two stories tell us of God's extravagant grace. The sheep and the coin do nothing to be found. Perhaps the sheep is by, in a way, out there somewhere. Or perhaps it is keeping silent, hoping that no predator will find it. The coin is just sitting there. It is the shepherd and the woman who seek after them, just as God does for us. It is not because we finally got it right or figured out what we were doing wrong. God looks for us because that is who God is, wildly extravagant, wildly loving. God keeps looking. Our negligence, rebellion, misuse of our talents and resources, our sinfulness and selfishness, None of that causes God to give up on us. In our reading from 1 Timothy, Paul uses his own life as an example of what we are talking about. Certainly, if there were someone God would want to walk away from, it would have been Paul. He actively persecuted the church, throwing people in jail for their faith. In the book of Acts, soon to be discovered by Corinna, when Stephen is stoned, it is at Saul's feet, Saul, who would later be known as Paul, that their garments were laid. Yet God does not give up on Paul, who became the one who preached the gospel to the Gentiles and who was the writer on many of the letters we now read in the New Testament. Paul knew what he was talking about when he said, the saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So where do we find ourselves in these two stories? I suspect that if we are honest, we find ourselves among the lost at one time or another. Our lostness may stem from broken relationships with a spouse or our kids. 
It may involve addiction to alcohol, drugs, work, or food. It may be from despair, from giving up on ourselves, from selfishness and self-absorption. It may be from behaving in ways that are hurtful or wrong. But whatever it is, no matter how lost we are, we are never lost to God. God, like the shepherd, leaves the rest of the flock and searches around for us. God, like the housewife searching for her precious coin, explores every dark corner to find us. And what if we are the 99 sheep? or the nine coins. Jesus speaks of one sheep that strays and 99 which do not. He distinguishes between the one person who repents and the 99 righteous people who need no repentance. Maybe Jesus delivers that line with a slight smile on his face. He may mean that those 99 simply believe that they have no need for repentance when in fact they needed as much as the one identified sinner. Their belief that they are righteous is mistaken. If so, then the distinction is not between one sinner who repents and the other 99 people who do not need to. The distinction is rather between those aware of their need for repentance and those unaware or unwilling to admit that they have this need. In the context in which Jesus was speaking, look at who drew close to him. It was the people on the margins of society, the outcasts and sinners, condemned by the power structure, condemned even by themselves. The 99 would be made up of the Pharisees and scribes who kept their distance from Jesus and murmured against him for what he said, for what he did, for his choice of companions. They were the ones who enjoyed positions of respect in this society and held themselves in high esteem, the 99. Two thoughts about being part of the 99. First, there is the danger of being self-satisfied. I have it all together, and just about everything I do is okay. I won't even think about the parts of my life that may be less than respectable, less than perfect. I have it all together. And look at all those others. Look at them, the losers, the sinners, the lost. I am not like them. I am special in God's eyes, but not those people. We're probably more sophisticated, more subtle in how we think about and express this. But that danger is always there, presuming that we are the chosen ones and not them, whoever them might be. And secondly, we cannot assume that being among the 99 or the 9 is a permanent position. It's not like we sin once in our lives, seek repentance, and then it's all smooth sailing, I've got it made. Each of us turns out to be a lost sheep. Each of us is often enough the precious coin which disappears, the car keys or the cell phone that annoyingly cannot be found. Our lives, we mess up, we fall short of the mark, in small ways and in big ways, which means that repentance needs to be a regular practice in our lives. That may sound burdensome. It may seem a practice oriented to the past, preoccupied with beating oneself up with regret. Actually, repentance can be the exact opposite. Metanoia, the New Testament word for repentance, means literally a change of mind, a turning around, a shift out of the past that prepares us for a better future. You're going in the wrong direction. With God's help, you turn around and face the right way. This understanding is built into our lives together. One is the regular praying of the Lord's Prayer with its request, forgive us our trespasses, forgive us our sins. That's metanoia. I request that we not be stuck in our sins, not be stuck in our mistaken sense of righteousness, free to turn around and begin anew. Another is the confession of sin, which we pray when we celebrate the Eucharist. We together acknowledge that we have fallen short, that we see ourselves not as the 99 who have no need for repentance, but as the one who has strayed, 
the one who is lost and needs to be brought back, who needs to be found. This holds true of the worst reprobate and the most splendid saint. We all have fallen short. The words that follow the absolution ask that God have mercy, forgive, strengthen, and keep us. The party has begun. For what happens when God finds us? There is the wonderful picture of the shepherd who does not drive the now found sheep in front of him. Rather, he caught, carries it on his shoulder, not an easy task with a full-grown sheep. And then there is the party. Both the shepherd and the woman call together their friends and neighbors and invite them to come and celebrate. There is joy in heaven, which tells us a lot about who God is, a God who rejoices and parties. Each week, we gather around this table. It is no accident that what we do is called the Eucharist, which means to give thanks. And we talk about celebrating the Eucharist. So come with joy. Come with thanks for the love that never lets us go. The love that will always search us out when we are lost and bring us home rejoicing. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.